Good morning and welcome to this, the 15th meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee in 2018. Can I make the usual request that mobile devices are switched onto airplane mode and mobile phones are off the table. Uh, before we kick off this morning, I have a statement to make. Um, I'd like to make a, a brief statement about the committee's report on prisoner voting in Scotland, which was published at the beginning of this week. I would like to place on record my personal disappointment that the findings of the report were leaked to a national newspaper where it appeared on the front page on Friday the 11th of May. So for the avoidance of doubt, I would like to draw members' attentions to the following provisions of the Code of Conduct for MSPs. In the section under confidentiality rules at section 12, all drafts of committee reports and committee reports which, although agreed by a committee and no longer in draft, have not yet been published, should be kept confidential unless the committee decides otherwise. In addition, the following should be treated as confidential. Briefing provided to members by parliamentary staff or particular members' information only. Documents produced during a private session of a committee. Evidence submitted to a committee sitting in private from a witness, which it has, a, has been agreed can be treated as confidential. Any other documents or information which the committee has agreed should be treated as confidential. And minutes of any private discussions. At section 13, unless the parliament or the relevant committee has agreed otherwise, such documents should not be circulated, shown or transmitted in any other way to members of the public, including those in cross-party groups, media or to any member or any organisation out with the parliament, including the Scottish Government, nor to other MSPs who are not members of the committee or the committees for whom the material was intended. At 14, members must not provide the media with off-the-record briefings on the general comments or line of draft committee reports or other confidential material or information. Disclosures of this kind can also seriously undermine and devalue the work of committees. At section 15, unless the Parliament or the relevant committee has agreed otherwise, members must not disclose any information to which a member has privileged access, for example, derived from a confidential document or details of discussions or votes taken in private session, either orally or in writing. And in 16, where a committee member wishes to express dissent from a committee report, the member should only make this public once the committee report has been published in order to avoid disclosing the conclusions of a draft report. In light of the recent, recent press reports, I would like to emphasise to all members the importance of complying with these rules and to ask that particular attention is paid to them in the future. Having been a member of the former Equal Opportunities Committee in a previous session, I know there is a long-standing tradition of keeping politics to a minimum in our committee's work. Whenever possible, we try to put politics to one side and put those who are the most vulnerable in our society at the forefront, so that their voice is heard in the decision-making process. Over time, we have gained the trust of those who we have shared their life experience with us and they expect us to treat their information respectfully. A short-lived political stunt strikes at the heart of this hard-won reputation. As parliamentarians, we have standards to live up to, not just for those who govern our conduct, but importantly, for the people of Scotland. It is my hope that the committee can, can move forward in a collegiate manner, although I recognise it will take some time to build that trust again, trust which is fundamental to the effectiveness of this committee in helping the most marginalised in our society. And that ends my statement this morning, and I wish to move straight on to agenda item one, which is stage two consideration of the historic... <coughs> Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregard Scotland Bill. I'd like to welcome Michael Matheson, MSP, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, who's joining us um, today as the Minister in charge of the Bill. And I'd also like to welcome our colleague Stuart Stevenson, who is here to speak to amendment in his name. Our aim is to complete stage two consideration this morning. And before we move on to consideration of amendments, I would like to be, it would be helpful, I think, to set out the procedure for stage two. Everyone should have with them a copy of the bill as introduced, the martial list of amendments that was published on Monday, and the groupings of these amendments, which set out the amendments in, or in the order in which they will be debated. There will be one debate on each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in each group to speak to and move their amendment, and to speak to all the other amendments in that group. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should indicate to me in the usual way. If the Cabinet Secretary has not already spoken on the group, I will then invite him to contribute to the debate just before I move to the winding up speech. As with a debate in the Chamber, the member who is winding up on a group may take intervention from other members if they wish. The debate on each group will be concluded by me inviting the member to move the First Amendment in the group to wind up. 
Following debate on each group, I will check whether the member who has moved the first amendment in the group wishes to press their amendment to a vote or to withdraw it. If they wish to press ahead, I will put the question uh, on that amendment. If the member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek the committee's agreement to do so. If the committee member objects, if any committee member objects, the committee must immediately move to the vote on the amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment when I call it, they should say not moved. Please rem remember that any other MSP may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the Marshall list. Only committee members are allowed to vote at stage two. Voting in any, in any decision is by a show of hands. It is important that members keep their hands clearly raised until the clerk has recorded the vote. The committee is required to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed each section of the schedule of the bill, so I will put that <coughs> question at each appropriate point. So, moving on to the marshalled list and the amendments this morning, I call Amendment 6 in the name of Jamie Green and a group of its own. Jamie, to move and speak to Amendment 6, please. Uh, thank you, good uh, convener, and good morning to the panel and to the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I probably should just say from the outset, uh, my amendments today are intended to be helpful uh, at all stages, um, and I look forward to feedback from other members and indeed the Cabinet Secretary on uh, the specific wording of any of them at this stage. Um, I'll start with uh, uh, Amendment 6, which is a short amendment uh, with regards to um, Section 2 uh, and the definition of sexual activity between men. Uh, in my view, the uh, current wording uh, in Subsection 4A, uh, which states that any physical activity between males of any age which is uh, of a type uh, of an intimate personal relationship, uh, left open the possibility of um, being quite loose in its interpretation uh, in that um, intimate personal relationships between men who are over the age of 16 and those who are under uh, is, uh, would, would not be covered by uh, pardon or disregard. So whilst I appreciate that offences which are still offences today are covered by the bill. Um, my understanding of reading this particular wording, especially the words of any age, uh, didn't provide any clarification uh, uh, or left it open perhaps to interpretation uh, that it would be interpreted as acceptable that intimate relationships uh, between men who are under and over the age of 16 uh, would be uh, potentially uh, included in this. So for that reason, I've added a, a single line in to say that the activity, providing that the activity is not between a person who has attained the age of 16 years and one who is not, just for the point of uh, um, strengthening uh, the uh, understanding of what sexual activity uh, is or is not acceptable today. Um, that's all. Okay. Uh, before we move on to the open debate in the Cabinet Secretary, um, is committee ag agreed? So the question is, that section one be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yeah. So that was us moving on to section two. Any other comments from committee colleagues? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, good morning, convener. Um, convener, I understand that Amendment 6 is intended to ensure that a pardon or disregard is never granted to a person who engages in sexual activity with a child under the age of 16. I understand the member's concern, uh, and I'd like to explain why the amendment is actually not necessary and may indeed have unintended consequences. Protections are already built into the bill to ensure that where a person is convicted for sexual activity that remains unlawful, that person is not pardoned and a disregard will not be granted. Section 3 of the bill makes clear that a person who has been convicted of a historical sexual offence is pardoned for the offence only if the conduct constituting the offence is not an offence when the Act comes into force. Section 73B of the Bill provides that a disregard is not to be granted if it appears to the Scottish Ministers that the conduct constituting the historical sexual offence would still be an offence when the Act comes into force. This amendment, by applying a blanket exclusion for any offence where one person has attained the age of 16 and the other has not, runs the risk of excluding cases where the activity in question is lawful and the pardon and disregard should apply. 
The definition of a historical sexual offence is necessarily very broad and covers activity that people might not necessarily think of as sexual. Committee members have heard evidence uh, heard evidence from a man who says he was convicted of a breach of the peace for kissing his same-sex partner in a public place. The effect of this amendment would be to exclude, for example, a 16-year-old convicted of a breach of the peace for kissing or holding hands with his 15-year-old same-sex partner. This would not be a criminal offence now and would never have been a criminal offence where it involved opposite sex partners. Therefore, I would invite the member not to press Amendment 6. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jimmy Green to wind up and <coughs> press or withdraw. Uh, thank you, Convener. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I think that example is a good illustration, actually. I, I, I struggled to uh, think of any practical applications of whether it would be acceptable uh, if an offence had been committed with an under 16 year old and over 16 year old. Um, the example the Cabinet Secretary gives, uh, I, for example, would never want to uh, inhibit someone's ability to uh, apply for a pardon or disregard in that respect. Um, my my uh, hope is, was that this would not provide any loopholes in, in the legislation by the wording of any, of any age, but given the example that the Cabinet Secretary has given, that's uh, clarified, I think, uh, my uh, confusion over it, and for that reason I would, would be happy not to move that amendment. It's withdrawal, isn't it? Can, withdraw, to withdraw sorry. the amendment. Indeed. Committee agreed to withdraw. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to Amendment 7, uh, also in the name of Jamie Green, grouped with Amendment 13. Jamie Green to move Amendment 7 and speak to both amendments in the group. Jamie. Thank you, Convener. Uh, amendment 7, uh, again, is a short amendment which uh, gives the uh, give ministers the ability to add offences in the future uh, to the definition of historic sexual offence. At the moment, historic sexual offence is, uh, and, and the parameters around that is quite clearly detailed in section two. Uh, and uh, as it stands, I think uh, there's broad agreement that that covers uh, most bases. Um, the purpose of this amendment, however, is to future-proof the legislation in respect that um, if, uh, in the perhaps unlikely event, but if in the event that our sexual offence laws change in the future, that the ministers would have the ability to include uh, uh, other definitions uh, in uh, in this legislation. Uh, this this particular uh, amendment leads into another amendment which I'll speak to later, uh, amendments 10 and 11, around um, the ability to alter uh, the purpose of the legislation. Uh, at the moment, I think there's broad agreement as to what we consider um, uh, the purpose of the, the, the bill is uh, with res respect to historic offences. Um, but it, it, our experience of, the, of other legislation, which has tried to achieve the same thing, uh, we have since discovered that people have come forward with a number of, in some cases, quite unusual uh, offences that they had been convicted of. Um, as uh, awareness of the legislation is out there in the community. Um, and we have found deficiencies in other pieces of, of similar legislation uh, in that the definition was too narrow. Now, I think the definition in this piece of legislation is good, um, but I don't think it allows the opportunity, from a technical point of view, for uh, ministers in the future to alter the definition of a sexual offence. Um, subject to perhaps further consultation or legal advice. So I think the purpose of this is to uh, not state that ministers must add further definitions, um, but it gives them the option to add historic sexual offence is uh, subject to regulation, appropriate regulation, and that's uh, <coughs> the uh, only reason that I've uh, included this amendment. I'd be keen to hear the Cabinet Secretary's views on it. Okay, colleagues. No, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, convener, Amendment 7 provides for a regulation-making power to add new offences to the list of historical sexual offences at Section 2 of the Bill. It might be helpful to the Committee if I reiterate that Section 2.2 already provides for a catch-all provision, which provides that a historical sexual offence includes any other offences which regulated 
or was used in practice to regulate sexual activity between men and which has either been repealed or abolished or which once covered sexual activity between men of a type which, or in circumstances which, would not amount to an offence now. This provision is included in the Bill because we recognise that while efforts have been made to identify the offences which were used to prosecute same-sex sexual activity, which is now legal, we know that other common law or statutory offences such as breach of the peace or indeed local bylaws may have been used to prosecute such activity. This ensures that a person with a conviction of any offence which was used to prosecute same-sex sexual activity that is now legal is pardoned and can apply for a disregard without the need for a power to add new offences to the list at Section 2.1. In that sense, the power would serve no useful legal purpose. It's unlikely it would ever be used. And because it's actually not limited on its face to sexual activity used to prosecute same-sex sexual activity between men, it could be used to add sexual offences of any kind to the list at Section 2. For instance, offences used to prosecute sexual activity between partners of opposite sex. Members will be aware that the Bill is limited to deal with the discrimination against men and men involved in same-sex sexual activity, so we do not consider that it would be appropriate for the scope of the legislation to be fundamentally altered through secondary legislation in this way. And on that basis, I would invite the member not to press his amendment. Okay. Jamie Green, to wind up our press. Thank you, Convener. I should have added that uh, Amendment 13 was a technical amendment linked to Amendment 7. I, I didn't do that previously. Um, I, I hear what the Cabinet Secretary says. Um, I, 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 I guess I'm looking for reassurance that subsection 2, two does actually uh, enable uh, in future the flexibility that I'm looking for, that all uh, types of offences, not just sexual offences, and, and of course uh, clearly, my intention was not to include uh, other types of sexual offences which are out with the, the, the remit of the bill. That's, that was absolutely not the intention. If it's worded in that way, then I apologise. But um, if, for example, um, people were convicted of uh, a wide range of other behaviours, um, uh, which in future um, are deemed to be able to take advantage of the legislation. My hope is that, as it's currently drafted, that these people will be able to come forward and take advantage of the legislation. Uh, the, the, the intent of, of my amendment was simply to allow uh, ministers in future to add certainty where perhaps there isn't at the moment uh, if and when uh, uh, new uh, cases come forward. Now, I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary says that this power may never be used, but it may be used. We don't know who is out there, and we don't know who will come forward with very individual and specific circumstances. Um, that really was the intention of, of the amendment, uh, to give uh, ministers in future that flexibility. So I, I'm hoping, as it's currently drafted, um, it has that flexibility. Um, uh, so I'd be minded not to move it uh, for that reason, um, but perhaps uh, it's, it's something that I could chat to the, the Cabinet Secretary's bill team uh, to maybe clarify how some future um, circumstances may arise and how people could go about taking advantage of the scheme where it's not clear at the moment if they committed an offence or not. That would be very helpful. Cabinet Secretary, given that Jamie Green and you summing up has asked for a point of clarification, do you want to come back? Yeah, I think... Um, it it, the first thing to say is that it's not clear to me what what present legislation we have in place that would criminalise activity between same-sex partners um, that we would want to repeal at some point again in the future because um, that legislation has already been uh, has already been addressed. Uh, the second thing here is that um, uh, if there are changes in some shape or fashion in the future, uh, this bill deals with historical matters. Uh, therefore, uh, trying to make some sort of provision to do with something in the future uh, wouldn't be within the terms of the bill in itself because it's dealing with historical matters. But the other, as I say, the important point here is that I'm, uh, I can't think of any piece of legislation that we have in place that would actually continue to discriminate against same-sex uh, uh, 
uh, partners in the way in which this bill is seeking to address the issues of historical legislation uh, that did discriminate against them and to provide the pardon and the disregard for them. Jamie, do you wish to press or withdraw? Withdraw. To withdraw. Committee happy to withdraw? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the question is that section two be agreed. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that section three and four be agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed. And I now move on to call amendment one in the name of Mary Fee and a group of its own. Mary to move and speak to amendment one. Thank you, um, convener. Firstly, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Tim Hopkins of the Ecology Network for his work in assisting with the drafting of my amendments. Tim's knowledge in this field is unrivalled and his expertise has been invaluable to me throughout this process. I'd also like to put on record my thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice for his continued constructive dialogue, which I have greatly appreciated. Amendment 1 in my name um, would provide for a pardon letter for deceased persons. And today, as colleagues will know, is International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia and Transphobia, a worldwide day of campaigning and celebration. So it's a particularly <coughs> appropriate day to consider this bill. And after similar legislation to this bill came into effect south of the border last year, 94-year-old George Montague publicly criticised <coughs> the legislation. He had been convicted for consensual sex with another man in 1974. He said, I will not accept a pardon. To accept a pardon means you accept that you are guilty. I was not guilty of anything. He called for an apology to be provided instead. And it is right to provide the pardon and the disregard, but the committee agreed in our stage one report that those are not enough. Front and centre of any responses to these convictions should be a declaration of the wrongfulness and discriminatory effect of the convictions, which is set out in section one of the bill, and also the First Minister's unreserved apology in the Scottish Parliament. Those make clear that the wrong was done to the convicted person, not by them. In our report, the committee asked the Scottish Government to consider how there would be a way of providing a letter of comfort to families of deceased people with these convictions. My Amendment 1 is ex intended to explore that further. Amendment 1 proposes in subsection 1 that a close family member of a deceased person with a relative conviction, a relevant conviction, would be able to apply to the Scottish ministers for a letter of comfort. Subsection 2 provides that an application could not be made if an application for a disregard for the same conviction has already been made by the deceased person and dealt with before they died. Subsection 3 provides that in the application for the letter, the family member would include as much information as they know about the conviction. The family member may not have detailed information on the conviction, also, the deceased person's criminal records may have been deleted when they died. So it might well be that the full details of the conviction will not be available to Scottish ministers. I have therefore recognised in the amendment that the proposed letter of comfort cannot be an unconditional letter, saying that the deceased person has definitely been pardoned. It would need to be a conditional letter which says that the person has been pardoned if the conviction was for a historical sexual offence that is not a crime today. It would need to explain in general terms what that means. Subsection 4 therefore provides that Scottish ministers would not supply the letter if it was clear from the information in the application that the pardon would not apply. Otherwise, they would provide the letter with no further checks being needed since the letter itself has to be conditional. An applicant would receive the letter unless it was already clear from the information they provided in the application that the pardon did not apply. This would avoid the difficulty of an applicant finding out from Scottish Minister's reply that investigation of the records had cast doubt on the pardon applying. That would provide the opposite of comfort. Subsection 5 sets out the content of the letter. The letter would explain the application of the pardon. It would include a statement acknowledging the wrongfulness and discriminatory effect of convictions pardoned by the Act. 
it would also include an apology for those convictions in similar terms to those used by the First Minister in her speech to the Parliament on the 7th of November last year. Subsection 5 also proposes that the letter be signed by the First Minister, reflecting her statement to the Parliament. And finally, subsection 6 lists the close family members who could apply for the letter. It is unlikely that there would be a large number of these applications made by relatives of deceased people, but it could be a great comfort to relatives to provide a letter, even though the letter cannot be unconditional. The extra load on the Scottish Government in providing these letters would be very small, and I appreciate that it might be possible to provide these letters administratively without needing provision directly in the Bill. And I hope that the Government will commit to do what it can to make this possible, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Mary. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to start by echoing um, Mary's thanks to Tim Hopkins and the Equalities Network, not least for the uh, work they've done on this amendment, but also in helping us throughout the conduct of this entire build process. It's been very illuminating. Um, I think w I intimated to the Chamber in my remarks around stage one that the only deficiency I saw to this otherwise excellent piece of legislation was that it didn't, as drafted, extend not just comfort but justice to families of those uh, deceased men um, who uh, had been convicted for crimes that are now legal in the context of their sexuality. I think it's fair to say that the, um, there is a human cost to the application of criminal justice in less enlightened times, which uh, um, is measured out in tragedy in the, in the lives that were uh, perhaps cut short um, by people taking their own lives as a result of the, the shame or um, uh, embarrassment caused by this criminal uh, record hanging as a millstone as it did. And I think, just to echo um, my support for Mary Fee's amendment here, that I think that this will um, close that gap. It will uh, uh, be the final piece in the jigsaw in what is not just a historic piece of legislation for this Parliament, but a, a very important one as well. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. I'd just like to echo the comments made by my committee colleagues. So I think Mary Fee very eloquently stated the case. Um, and as Alex Cole-Hamilton said, that uh, there was a f missing piece of the jig, so I felt very strongly too that the ability for family members or uh, partners, uh, etc., of uh, people who are now deceased should be able to also receive, uh, other than just a blanket apology, some form of um, individualised um, uh, and something quite personal to them that would allow them to move on in, in some of the tragic circumstances that I think have been alluded to. Um, I, I, again, it w I think there will be a small number of people who may choose to take advantage of this type of, uh, uh, of uh, application, um, but nonetheless they should be offered the opportunity to. So in whichever form it ends up uh, in terms of the concept, I very much support it. Thank you. No more comments? Cabinet Secretary. In convening an amendment 16 to put in place a statutory mechanism whereby relatives of a person who has died, who believe that person was convicted of an offence for engaging in same-sex sexual activity that is now lawful, can apply to receive a letter of comfort, which would provide a conditional pardon and disregard based on information provided by the deceased person's relatives. Convener, I can understand why committee members may consider that the relatives of a person who has died might wish to apply for a posthumous disregard so as to confirm that their relative has been pardoned. As I explained at stage and during the stage one debate, there are a number of potential problems with this. The primary difficulty is that when a person has died, it is likely that the information held about them on the criminal history system may have been removed and there may be little or no information available on which ministers can make a decision about whether the disregard should be granted. A second issue may arise in cases where family members were unaware of the actual circumstances in which their relative was convicted of an offence and could, as a result, receive unwelcome news that their relative was in fact convicted of say, a serious sexual offence. I am, however, sympathetic to the intention behind this amendment, and I can confirm that the Scottish Government is content to put in place such a scheme. 
It is, however, not clear to me that the scheme requires to be placed in statute, and indeed, indeed I believe it would be more appropriate in the circumstances to have flexibility that would, provide, would be provided by a purely administrative, administrative scheme rather than one based in statute. Therefore, I hope this reassures members that the administrative scheme to enable relatives of a deceased person to receive a letter of comfort of the kind envisaged by this amendment will be put in place. I can also confirm that the letters will be signed by the First Minister, and I would therefore invite the member not to press her amendment. Mary Fee, to wind up, press or withdraw. Um, Thank you, Convener. Can I um, thank the Cabinet Secretary for his very constructive and supportive um, comments? And I, I fully understand the concerns that the Cabinet Secretary raised around um, the, the legal um, difficulties that could potentially arise. Um, and I, I do welcome his commitment to provide um, a letter of comfort to family members. And on the basis of these comments, I will withdraw my amendment. Committee content? Yep. yep. Okay, thank you very much, Mary Fee. Um, I now call Amendment 2 in the name of Stuart Stevenson, grouped with Amendments 8, 3, 3A and 14. Stuart Stevenson, can I ask you to move Amendment 2 and speak to all of the amendments in the group? Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and I start by moving Amendment 2 in my name. Uh, my amendment, which I trust uh, committee members will feel is simple, straightforward and with no side effects beyond its central purpose, follows my comments during the Stage 1 debate on certain aspects of the Bill's drafting. Uh, briefly, Section 5.2 of the Bill sets out the information that a person applying for a disregard must provide in their application. Section 5.2b of the Bill requires the applicant to state their name and address at the time of conviction. However, as I said in debate, uh, given the passage of time and the social circumstances under which many of the people who might uh, seek uh, such a disregard, it may well be possible that some applicants are not able to state with the required certainty what their address was at the time that they were convicted. Uh, perhaps less likely, I've also realised after further consideration that it's also possible that an applicant may have changed their name and may not be entirely sure whether the conviction occurred before or after the time that they changed their name. There could be cases where an applicant cannot say with the required certainty what their name was at the time they were convicted. This amendment amends Section 5.2b of the Bill to provide that an applicant must state their name and address at the time of conviction, but would now be qualified with insofar as it is known to the applicant. That brings the requirement into line with sections 5.2c and 5.2d regarding associated information the applicant is asked to provide about the offence and conviction. Uh, I don't intend, convener, to speak on other amendments in the group. Um, I encourage uh, committee members, as I'm sure they always would, to give due weight to their movers' comments and to the Cabinet Secretary's response. Convener. Thank you very much. Um, Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 8 and other <coughs> amendments in the group. Jamie. Uh, thank you, Convener. I've got no comments on Mr Stevenson's amendment. Uh, he, as always, comes to committee with sage words. Uh, I'll speak to my uh, amendments. I'll start with Amendment 8, and maybe uh, I like, can explain the premise of it if it's not entirely clear in the wording or, indeed, if it's not entirely um, efficient in what it's trying to achieve. Um, my aim with this is really to ensure that as wide a number of people can take advantage of this and given the nature of perhaps the demographic of the types of people who may wish to apply for a disregard I think it's important to allow a uh, provision that would, uh, that would give people the opportunity to re receive assistance and help in their application and indeed uh, for someone to make the application with their consent on their behalf. Now the wording I've used is on behalf of a person who has been convicted. Now I appreciate as it's currently worded and I'm willing to, to discuss this, uh, that if that means, as it's currently worded, that anyone could apply for anyone else without their consent, then that's not the purpose of the amendment. Um, I am uh, of the view that, for example, people may and should be able to take advantage of third-party organisations, uh, some of the excellent organisations we heard from, given evidence such as the uh, Equality Network, Stonewall, other charities, advocacy groups, or even uh, simple family members or or, or partners or spouses 
um, uh, of people who are either perhaps physically incapable or perhaps uh, uh, due to other reasons uh, are, are indeed, um, you know, mentally, for example, need some assistance with the application. And the purpose of this amendment is really to help make provision that the government would accept an application uh, from a third party um, with due consent uh, as deemed appropriate. Um, again, if the wording as it stands doesn't meet that requirement, I would ask that the Cabinet Secretary would give thought to the process is that as it currently worded, my understanding is the bill would only accept an application from the first person, not from any other. And I, I would like to think that uh, a third party application could be a possibility and that's the purpose of my amendment. Um, on the other amendments, uh, Amendment 3A, um, I'll be keen to hear uh, what Mary Fee has to say on Amendment 3. It's uh, perhaps uh, of, of the same ilk, but a little bit shorter. Um, uh, I would be uh, minded to perhaps not move Amendment 3A uh, if, uh, if, if Mary moves uh, Amendment 3. My definition of a certificate, I think the certificate perhaps is prescriptive, um, whether it's a certificate or a letter. I was always of the view throughout this process that, it, that there should be something symbolic given uh, to people who have been successful in their application. Whether it is a letter or a certificate is, 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 is I think, uh, for debate. Um, but the purpose of 3A was really to ensure that they get something. I hear the comments that were made in the previous section uh, around uh, people applying for deceased members, and I'd like to think that opportunity would be extended to um, people uh, who are living who have a successful application. So, again, that's something I'll, I'll, I'll listen further to. Uh, amendment 14 is, is a technical amendment which relates to Amendment 8, uh, so I, I won't speak too much on that. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, Mary Fee, to speak to Amendment 3 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, amendment 3 um, d discusses the contents of the disregard notice. And as I said when we considered Amendment 1, it's crucial that any response to a conviction which is pardoned under this bill acknowledges that the wrongfulness of the condition and provides an apology. Amendment 3 explores the content of the notice that is issued to an applicant when a disregard is granted. The amendment proposes that the notice must include a clear statement that the applicant has been pardoned. It would also state that the wrongfulness and discriminatory effect of their condition, conviction sorry, is acknowledged by the <coughs> Act. It would also include an apology to the applicant in similar terms to those used by the First Minister in her statement in the Chamber on 7th of November last year and would be signed by her. Including this content in the notice of disregard sent to the applicant would help address the criticism that providing a pardon could be seen as confirming that the applicant did something wrong. It is right that the notice should include a clear apology and an acknowledgement that the wrong was done to the applicant, not by them. Jamie Green's Amendment 3A would provide that the notice of disregard should be in the form of a formal certificate, and that would also be um, useful. I recognise that it might be possible to implement these measures without needing explicit, explicit provision in the bill. I do, however, think it's important that there is a clear commitment to provide this kind of response to people who are granted a disregard, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Mary. Um, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Convener. I have a couple of brief uh, reflections, um, both on Jamie Green and Mary Fee's amendments 8 and 3, respectively. I think in respect of... Jamie Green's Amendment 8, um, I do have some sympathy for this. I think that um, it, we have many pieces of legislation where we include a right to invent independent advocacy. Um, we recognise that diminished capacity can mean that sometimes that actually just the act of filling in a form can um, be difficult for an individual. Um, my only slight reservation is about it in terms of how we ensure that informed consent is uh, guaranteed that, that this is the will of the person who's seeking the application and and, uh, and I will reflect further on the cabinet secretary's response to this but I'm, I'm sure that that could be dealt with in in guidance um so at, at present I'm minded to support Jamie's but depending on how how the cabinet secretary picks that up Mary Fee I think this is an, an excellent amendment it speaks very much to the the eloquent remarks she made at the top of the meeting about um the importance of this not just being uh, a redaction of the record, but actually a, a recognition that we as a country got this wrong and we harmed a great many people in the application of our laws. Uh, so I think that this, this recognition and apology, profound apology, is the very least that these men deserve. Okay, thank you. Gail Ross. 
Thank you, convener. Good morning, um, panel. I wanted just to just a quick comment on um, Amendment Eight, and I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would um, mention or, or speak to this in his response. Um, I just wonder if this amendment is actually necessary because don't do the normal laws of power of attorney not already cover this? And I just wondered if you would address that when you reply. Thanks. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, convener, Amendment 2 addresses the point which Stuart Stevenson raised at the Stage 1 debate on the 17th of April regarding Section 5 of the Bill, which sets out the information that a person seeking a disregard must include in their application. Section 5.2 of the Bill requires the applicant to state their name and address at the time of conviction. As Stuart Stevenson noted, given the passage of time, it is possible that some applicants may not be able to state with certainty what their address was at the time, uh, that they, at the time they were convicted. While perhaps less likely, uh, as it is possible that an applicant may have changed their name and may not be entirely sure whether the conviction occurred before or after the time that they changed their name. There may also be cases where an applicant cannot say with certainty what name uh, was at the, what their name was at the time when they were convicted, and I therefore would ask the committee to support Amendment Two. Turning to Amendment Three, this amendment seeks to set out in statute what requires to be included in a letter, which confirms that a disregard has been granted. It places a duty on Scottish ministers to include in any such letter a statement making clear that the applicant has been pardoned for historical sexual offence, eh, noting that the wrongfulness and discriminatory effect of the conviction are acknowledged by the Act and an apology for the conviction, acknowledging the wrong done to the applicant by the State. It also requires a letter to be signed by the First Minister. And Amendment 3A provides that the letter should be accompanied by a certificate of historical sexual offence disregard. I understand the importance of ensuring that the wrongfulness and discriminatory effect of the disregarded conviction is acknowledged and that a disregard letter should make clear that the wrong was done to the applicant and not by them. I can therefore confirm that the Scottish Government will ensure that these points are reflected in the letters to applicants confirming that a disregard has been granted. And on that basis, I would ask the member not to press the amendment. Turning to Amendment 8, which seeks to put in place a duty for Scottish ministers to make regulation to enable an application for a disregard to be submitted on behalf of a person who has been convicted of a historical sexual offence. There are already circumstances where a person asks, for example, a solicitor or a person who has a power of attorney to submit an application on their behalf. And I'd like to reassure the committee that the normal laws relating to agency and power of attorney would allow for, e.g., a person's solicitor or someone with power of attorney to submit an application on behalf of someone with such a conviction and without the need to make any specific provision in the bill to allow for this. I'm happy to give way. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for giving way. Um, I appreciate, uh, I think, that response perhaps to Gail Ross's question around existing provisions which allow for a power of attorney to apply on someone's behalf. My uh, worry with that is it's very focused uh, and restrictive to people with or agencies with power of attorney, not other third parties, such as those that Alec Cohammond mentioned, advocacy groups, third party groups, charities, or even individuals who may wish to make an application with relevant due consent as detailed in guidance, but the current provisions, uh, uh, based on what the Cabinet Secretary just said, would not guarantee that those people could make an application, and that's something that I would like to see, hence the amendment. Well, I think you need to recognise here the person will have to give consent for the purpose of someone else to apply on their behalf. If they don't have capacity to give that consent, then that's, uh, that's where the provision of a power of attorney would come into play. If the person gives consent uh, for another third party to make an application on their behalf, then that will apply. That can apply within the normal laws that stands at the present moment, but they will have to give consent. For the very reasons that Alex Cole Hamilton made reference to is that if you were to receive an application from, say, a third party, but the person 
for whom the application was for had not given consent to it, we would have no way of knowing whether that person's actually consented to the application in the first place. So they will always have to give consent if they have capacity. Where they don't have capacity, the provisions of power of attorney, etc., are applied. So, which is already stands in law. So, uh, for the very purpose of what you're actually saying, you're seeking to have this amendment for, that will already happen. Uh, and it happens within the existing legal framework that we have. There is no requirement for anything to be put in this legislation to allow that to happen. Okay. Any more comments? Uh, Stuart Stevens, can I ask you to wind up uh, in this group and press or withdraw your amendment? Uh, Thank you, convener, an illuminating debate where I learned some interesting things. Um, I'll, I'll just make a wee observation about name change. In Scots law, as I understand it, there is, of course, no direct legal process for changing your name. You can simply start using another name on any day that you choose. Uh, so that might just further illuminate the, the, the issue of name. And I have personal experience in someone I know. Uh, who, who, who did that. Um, nothing more to say. I think it's all been said, uh, convener, and I press my amendment. Okay, the question is that amendment to be agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed. agreed. The question is that section 5 be agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed. Okay, uh, and I call amendment 8 in the name of Jamie Green, already <laughs> debated with amendment 2. Jamie, to move or not move? To move. Okay. And the question, the question is that Amendment 8 be agreed? No. Are we all agreed? No. So, okay, we're going to uh, vote. Um, uh, those uh, who agree with Amendment 8, please show. And those against? And one, two, three. Yep. So Amendment 8 is not agreed. The question is that section 6 be agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed. Um, moving on to section 7, I call amendment 3 in the name of Mary Fee, already debated with amendment 2. Mary Fee to move or not to move? On the basis of the Cabinet Secretary's comments, not moved. Okay, but committee agreed with that, yeah. Okay. So I call amendment 2A in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with amendment 2. Jamie to move or not to move? Uh, 3A, uh, 3A. Uh, based on Mary Fee's comments, not move. <laughs> Not moved. Happy to do that. Okay. Um, so the question is amendment. No, amendment three. No, not moving it. Okay. Um, Mary, fee to press or withdraw amendment three. Withdraw. Withdraw. Happy to do that, committee. Yeah. The question is amendment. No, it's not. The question is that section seven be agreed. <laughs> Are we all agreed? <laughs> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> I call Amendment 9 in the name of Jamie Green and a group of its own. Jamie to move and speak to Amendment 9. Thank you, Convene. You're doing a sterling job. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll try not to overcomplicate this of one, one single amendment. Uh, we did talk in great detail uh, about um, the ability for legal aid to be given uh, to uh, people. I uh, appreciate there are already existing provisions and, and rules around that. Um, my amendment says simply that for the avoidance of doubt, uh, civil legal aid would be available subject to entitlement for the purpose of an appeal under the section. I think that's something that members felt strongly should be uh, available to them, that uh, this legislation is something that um, people should be able to benefit from, again, subject to entitlement, the legal aid system if they have to go through uh, an appeal. Um, and it's a, a very simple uh, um, uh, addition to clarify that that uh, was a strongly held view uh, and it is uh, indeed to, uh, to take away any doubt that people um, uh, may use uh, the legal aid system uh, for the purposes of appeals in this legislation and I would hope members would, uh, would support uh, uh, this amendment. Okay, um, Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, again, uh, thank you, convener. Again, I have a lot of sympathy with this amendment. We, this came up in the stage one debate and several times during proceedings. Um, I will support this amendment until, unless I hear from the cabinet secretary that other provision is existing, which will automatically trigger subject entitlement to lead legal aid in the normal run of things. I think that it's important there be no legal impediment to justice in this regard, and that goes for appeals as well. Thank you, Philip McGregor. <coughs> Thanks, convener. I wasn't on the committee at the, the stage one 
uh, deliberations, but my understanding is, that I'm not sure uh, what effect this amendment would have, because my understanding is people would be entitled to, to, if they were eligible anyway, they would be entitled to legal aid. So I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could, could clarify that before deciding how it would vote. Okay. Any other comments from Cabinet Secretary? No. Cabinet Secretary. Convener, Amendment 9 is intended to put beyond doubt that a person wishing to apply against the refusal of an application for a disregard is entitled to civil legal aid, subject to meeting the eligibility requirements. It might be helpful if I outline the Scottish Government's position concerning the availability of legal aid in respect of this bill. In terms of preparation of an application for a disregard, we do not anticipate that legal assistance should be required in order to submit an application for a disregard. This is because the application process will be designed to be as user-friendly as possible. We will be working with the Equality Network to ensure this user-friendly process is delivered. However, if an applicant does feel the need to seek legal advice and assistance from a solicitor, this would be available for the preparation of the application for a disregard, subject to the general eligibility requirements under Advice and Assistance Scheme. Where an applicant wishes to be represented in court in an appeal, civil legal aid is subject to eligibility requirements, including financial eligibility. I hope this reassures the committee that legal aid is available to someone wishing to appeal against the refusal of a disregard. Provision can be made for representation in court through advice by way of representation, ABWAR, instead of civil legal aid. ABWAR is advice and assistance provided to a person by taking on their behalf any steps in instituting or conducting any proceedings before a court. I can therefore confirm that the Scottish Government will bring forward regulations to make ABWAR available to a person who wishes to appeal a decision to refuse an application for a disregard subject to eligibility requirements. Importantly, provisions of ABWAR will not be conditional on financial eligibility tests. On that basis, I would ask the Member to withdraw Amendment 9. Jamie Green to wind up and indicate whether he wishes to press a withdrawal. Thank you, Convener. Um, on the first point around uh, the fact that people should not le need legal assistance to complete the initial application, I think that's a, a very important point, a very welcome comment. Uh, I, I appreciate that the, a lot of work will go into the application process to make sure it's as simple and, and jargon-free as possible, so that the widest uh, uh, variety of people can, can take opportunity of the process. Um, but the appeals process is somewhat different. Uh, it is a much more legal and technical uh, process, and for that reason, uh, I felt that um, subject to entitlement, um, we should be specific in, on the face of this bill. Um, however, based on the comments that the ca cabinet secretary has made and, and the commitment made by the Scottish government to offer assistance to people, which uh, it sounds like will not be means tested by, by financial means, that if people are rejected and choose to appeal, that um, uh, uh, I believe legal uh, assistance will uh, may be offered to them. Uh, and I think that's very, very welcome. It's a very positive step forward. I'm sure that will be appreciated by those who, in the future who uh, may need to use that process. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and, and the Scottish Government for that. And for that reason, I won't move the amendment. Do you wish to withdraw? Committee content? Yes. Yeah. Um, so the question is that section 8 to be agreed. Are we all agreed? Please. The question is that sections 9 to 13 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Agreed. And I call on Amendment 4 in the name of Annie Wells and a group of its own. Annie Wells to move and speak to Amendment 4. Annie. Thank you, Convener, and I move the amendment in my name. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. My amendment is to put the onus on the Scottish Government to take steps to publicly promote awareness and understanding of the operation of the Act. Um, during the committee sessions, it became clear that work would have to be done around the disregard process in order to advertise it, if you would like, its existence and to make it abundantly clear that despite the pardon, people still have to go through the separate process of applying for a disregard. And as intimated during evidence sessions, a witness intimated that having asked a couple of his friends about the bill, they knew nothing about it. So we cannot assume that this information will naturally disseminate into the wider public. So we need, to proactive, we need to be proactive in publicising it. 
and recognising that not all gay men, particularly those in more remote areas, are linked to LGBTI groups. Therefore, the reason I put the amendment forward, um, and I have moved the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Convener. I Just very briefly to say I support the amendment in the name of Annie Wells. Um, I believe that the, um, the statement of apology made by the First Min Minister was a welcome first step on our sort of national atonement in this, but I think the promotion of um, this scheme um, is, is very important to ensuring that um, people are aware not just of their rights to a disregard and, and a pardon, uh, but are actively encouraged to come forward to do so. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from colleagues? No. Cabinet Secretary. Convener, Amendment 4 seeks to put in place a requirement for the Scottish Ministers to take appropriate steps to promote public awareness and understanding of the operation of the Act. As set out in our response to the Committee Stage 1 report, I can confirm that we will work closely with relevant stakeholders, including Stonewall and the Equality Network, to ensure that people who may have convictions for historical sexual offences for engaging in activity that is now lawful are aware of the pardon and disregarding disregard scheme and of the distinction between the two. In doing so, we are also committed to considering the particular needs of people with such convictions who may be living in rural and remote communities. I would note that such a requirement is not normally included within legislation. The statute books would become very crowded if we were to have a provision uh, about publicity in relation to every new offence uh, or policy that was put into law. When a new offence or a significant policy change is created, the Scottish Government will always consider what steps are required to ensure that the public are made aware of these provisions. And I hope this provides reassurance that members are looking for, uh, and I would invite the member not to press her amendment. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Annie Wells, to wind up and indicate whether you wish to press or withdraw. Thank you, Convener. I welcome the, the remarks from the Cabinet Secretary, and on that note, I will withdraw my amendment. Committee content? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Moving on to um, the review of the Act, I call Amendment 10 in the name of Jamie <coughs> Green, grouped with Amendments 11 and 15. Jamie, to move Amendment 10 and speak to all of the amendments in the group. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Convener. Uh, the uh, members and uh, uh, the panellists will note that uh, Amendments 10 and 11 are very similar um, in nature. Um, Amendment 11 I'll, I'll come on to. Um, the purpose of this really is, is, is two things. Um, one is to give uh, ministers in future the opportunity to review the effectiveness of this Act. And the purpose of that, as detailed in Section 1 uh, and 2, uh, of, of my amendment is based on, uh, whilst this is in a very good place, this piece of legislation, we uh, in future have learned lessons again from uh, other pieces of legislation that sought to achieve similar outcomes. Um, things do arise. Um, we do our best uh, up front in, in this parliament to, to get legislation right, but review uh, of legislation is a, is a common thing. Uh, it, this, the wording of this appears in many other pieces of legislation and I think it would provide an opportunity that Scottish Ministers may, not must, review the effectiveness of that, this Act in the future uh, and by doing so consult uh, people as they consider appropriate, some of them perhaps in the room today. And I think that would be helpful in, uh, on a number of uh, uh, reasons that in, in the future uh, Ministers may uh, ensure that this uh, piece of legislation has really met its objectives, um, uh, and, and that's a sort of it's intended to be helpful in that respect. Um, sections uh, three and four, perhaps we dealt with earlier, and with regards to the ability, as part of that review, to <coughs> alter the definition of historical sexual offences. Um, the specific reason for ten and indeed eleven, which goes further, was to address another issue, which we discussed that at great detail. Uh, and that's around those, and something that I, I felt very strongly about, ar around those who had been um, uh, subject to um, offences while serving in, in our, our military. Uh, um, now, I appreciate that those offences may have been administered via other jurisdictions. Um, nowhere in my amendment am I seeking <coughs> to uh, try and, and, and uh, find a solution to that problem. I think we're all of, the, uh, of agreement that there is still an outstanding issue that this, neither this bill nor the legislation in England Wells addresses. There are still um, people out there who were uh, um, 
um, court-martialed or dismissed from the armed forces uh, for committing no offence whatsoever other than being uh, gay. Um, and whilst I don't for a minute expect this piece of legislation to deal with that, I do hope, though, that in future um, all concerned bodies, both governments um, and agencies and the military themselves, can uh, <coughs> sit down and come up with a solution to this problem. Um, there is no solution at the moment. There is discussion. Um, my amendment doesn't seek to uh, offer a solution. It, it simply allows that if in the future there is an agreement, for example, that commit f offences which were committed in Scotland or people who reside in Scotland uh, wish in future to uh, receive some sort of pardon or disregard for those types of offences, <coughs> that this piece of legislation may be used as a vehicle to do so. So I've been very careful the wording of it not to uh, uh, put in anything which is uh, uh, outside the competency of this parliament. Um, it simply asks the minister to consult on the matter um, and for that reason give subject to regulation the ability for ministers to alter the definition of historic sexual offences. Now the, the, uh, an example of that may be to include wording uh, to co cover those who uh, were dismissed from uh, the armed forces for committing a so-called offence. Um, but again, that, that is something that is subject to uh, you know, further discussion between um, uh, governments and agencies. So uh, I appreciate that those are, are, are difficult um, circumstances. We don't know what the outcome of those discussions may be. But I would like to think that uh, you know, due to the, the very progressive nature of this piece of legislation, which is uh, not as narrow as others, um, if it was possible in the future for this bill to be used as a mechanism to add further uh, uh, pardons and disregards, I would like to think it could be used so if it was deemed technically possible to do so. And that's the, the only reason I've added uh, Amendment 11. Uh, and I would hope the uh, Cabinet Secretary would have some sympathy with the premise of the amendment. Um, amendment uh, 15 uh, is a largely technical amendment which relates to uh, amendments 10 and 11, so I, I won't speak to those, but I'd be keen to hear other members' views perhaps on this and indeed the Cabinet Secretary's comments on, on the, my intention behind these amendments. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Um, Mary Fee. Thank you, um, convener. Um, I, I have um, a, a deal of, of, of sympathy for some of the comments that, um, that um, Jamie Green has, um, has, has just made. I mean, any, any legislation that is passed by um, Parliament, one of the most important aspects of that is, is how we make sure that the legislation adequately does the job it is intended to, to do. Um, I, I think the, um, the role of, of scrutiny and the effectiveness of this legislation, in, in, in my view, and I'd be interested in, in the Cabinet Secretary's view on this, this committee could play a particularly important role in that <coughs> with um, the, the Equality Network and, and other stakeholders. And as I say, I have sympathy um, for um, Jamie Green's intention with, with these amendments, but I, but I think this, this committee, as we go forward, would play a particularly crucial and important role in scrutiny in this legislation. Okay. Any other comments? Gail Ross. Yeah, um, maybe Jamie Green can um, talk to this point and uh, sum it up. I, I just wonder what, uh, in Amendment 11, Scottish ministers must consult Her Majesty's military forces. I mean, we know that that's a reserved issue, so I just, <coughs> I just wondered how that interplay would work and I don't know if maybe Cabinet Secretary wants to address that issue as well. Okay, any other comments? No, Cabinet Secretary. Convener, Amendment eight, 10 and 11 provide for two different versions of an amendment which provides for a power for the Scottish Ministers to review the outcome and effectiveness of the Act. I agree that it is important that we monitor and evaluate new legislation to ensure that it has the effect that was intended. However, members will note that Amendment 11 requires that, in undertaking such a review, Scottish ministers would be required to consult Her Majesty's military forces. As members will be aware, the power to legislate to grant pardons or disregards with respect to convictions for military offences is reserved to the UK Parliament, and someone uh, with such a conviction can apply for a disregard via the Home Office's disregard scheme. As such, I don't think it would be appropriate for a power to undertake a review of the operation and effectiveness 
of the Act to include such a requirement given this legislation will in fact uh, will not in fact impact on Her Majesty's uh, forces. I also have some concerns regarding the way the subsection three is drafted. It requires that in undertaking the review, the Scottish ministers seek advice on any further historical offences which take place in Scotland but are not listed under section two. I think this is what is intended I think what is intended is that Scottish ministers should seek advice as to whether there is evidence that people have been convicted of same-sex sexual activity that is now lawful, but is not included in the list contained in Section 2.1 of the Bill. As I said uh, earlier on to another amendment, um, I think that the catch-all nature of a definition of historical sexual offence in Section 2.2 means that the use of this power would be very unlikely, if ever at all. However, uh, Convener, Parliament also has an important role to play in the post-legislative scrutiny of legislation. In my view, it would be more appropriate for Parliament to conduct that process rather than internally within government. I therefore invite the member not to press um, these amendments. Okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Jamie Green to wind up and indicate whether you wish to press or withdraw. Uh, thank you, Vina. Thank you to my colleagues for their helpful and constructive comments. And maybe I can address some of the questions that they had. Um, I think Mary Fee makes a very good point. I think that this committee uh, in particular will have a very valuable and, and purposeful <laughs> role in reviewing the effectiveness of the Act in future. Um, uh, review of Acts and putting, placing a duty on ministers to review Acts uh, is common practice. Uh, it, it, it does add strength to the duty. Uh, I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's comments that it is perhaps for Parliament to review, not for ministers. Um, however, uh, I think Parliament always has a duty uh, throughout uh, it, its dealings to review legislation. Um, um, I, I, I will take on board uh, the comments around sec sections three and four. Um, I, I, the reason I submitted both 10 and 11 is that I, I, I knew that 11 would raise the issue that Gail Ross issued her incumbency in reserve matters, and I, I do appreciate that. It was really to stimulate the conversation around that. I still think there's no harm in uh, both governments and the military sitting down and having a conversation and the fact that some of the people who may wish to uh, or will be affected by that may res currently reside in Scotland or the offence may have been uh, may have t taken place in Scotland uh, albeit under other law um, so I by that by removing uh, uh, the references to the military forces in amendment 11 I would have thought that may have been more palatable to the cabinet secretary um, so uh, to address uh, um, uh, some of the other issues in here, I think um, if, if the committee is confident that Parliament itself, without placing a duty on ministers, uh, will uh, review this act, uh, then uh, I'm confident in the abilities of the committee to do so. So I will uh, withdraw amendments 10, uh, 11 and 15. We'll come to okay. 11 and 15. We'll yeah. come to that. <laughs> so you're... Happy to withdraw <coughs> Amendment 10? Yes. Cats Committee happy? Yep, agreed. Excellent. Okay, I call uh, Amendment 11 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 10. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not move. Not move. Okay, and I now call Amendment 12 in the name of Jamie Green and a group of its own. Jamie Green to move and speak to Amendment 12. Okay, uh, so just give me a second of doing too much speaking here. Um, <laughs> uh, this is around. Uh, this is an important uh, uh, amendment which I've included um, around uh, uh, guidance. The purpose, the premise of this initially, uh, when I spoke to the legislation team, uh, was to ensure that um, people would be signposted to this piece of legislation when going through disclosure uh, processes. So that's the background to this. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think that. Um, uh, guidance uh, should be issued around this legislation. Uh, that's the purpose of the inclusion of a, of a guidance clause. Um, but in particular, I would like uh, guidance to be given uh, with regards to disclosure schemes, particularly under the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Act 2007, uh, in so, uh, so far as they relate to uh, their interaction with this piece of legislation. Um, the reason for that is we discussed at great length um, uh, in the committee 
that we felt strongly um, that on the guidance for application uh, for uh, disclosure or, or enhanced or, or vetting processes that people should be signposted. Now, what I've, I've worded it in a way that doesn't say that the Scottish Government will have to reprint and redraft all current guidance for um, vetting processes and disclosure schemes. <coughs> I appreciate that's, that's onerous. Um, but in future iterations of that guidance, I would like to see uh, in black and white um, signposting towards this legislation. That's the purpose of the guidance. It's been drafted in, in, in this way for that reason. Um, I would hope that uh, other members of the committee would support the concept of both guidance being issued by the government, but also being explicit and full avoidance of doubt um, that uh, guidance should also um, be uh, addressed uh, under disclosure schemes. And the applications, uh, we heard, for example, evidence that people who had been applying for certain types of jobs and going through the process um, were not really aware of what they had or, ha or didn't have to put down uh, with regards to historic offences. Um, I'd like to think that people who are not aware of this piece of legislation, but perhaps interact with the legislation through the disclosure process, uh, will then be uh, very proactively signposted towards this piece of legislation, take advantage of that uh, process, the disregard process, and then perhaps proceed with their, their vetting processes. And I think that would be a very positive move. It may increase uptake um, of, of the disregards, uh, and also, I think, be, be uh, uh, not an overly onerous ask of the government to ensure that its guidance in those processes was very explicit as to the existence of this piece of legislation and not just leave it up to um, <clears throat> public awareness that it exists. So for that reason, I would ask um, uh, the committee to support um, Amendment 12. Can you move Amendment 12, Jim? I move it. Okay. Um, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Convener. Just <clears throat> very briefly, I, I have a great deal of sympathy with everything that uh, Jamie Green has said. I, I would have thought, however, though, that a bill of this nature, and given its interrelationships with other pieces of legislation like the Public Records Scotland Act, the uh, disclosure, um, relevant pieces of legislation around disclosure, but um, also, indeed, um, data protection legislation, would, by a prerequisite to the implementation, the successful implement, implementation of this Act would require quite an extensive amount of guidance anyway in terms of its application. So um, subject to the uh, Cabinet Secretary confirming that, then, then I wouldn't be minded to support it because I would imagine we couldn't go very far into this without the guidance. Other committee members wish to participate in the debate? No? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, convener, Amendment 12 places a requirement on the Scottish Ministers to issue guidance on such matters relating to the operation of the Act as they consider appropriate. I'd like to take this opportunity to reassure the Committee that the Scottish Government will provide guidance to those bodies responsible in any way for implementing the disregard scheme. I note that subsection 2 provides that this guidance must make provision concerning the disclosure scheme contained in the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 2007 insofar as it is affected by this Act. It might be helpful, though, if I clarify the disclosure scheme in question uh, are operated by Disclosure Scotland. They work on the basis of the information provided to them by Police Scotland. The purpose of the disregard scheme is to ensure that the disregarded convictions are either deleted or marked so that they are never disclosed. As a consequence, Police Scotland should not pass information about disregarded convictions to Disclosure Scotland for the purposes of disclosure checks. However, um, appropriate guidance will be provided to relevant bodies, including Disclosure Scotland, in taking forward the provisions within this bill. However, those provisions do not require to be on the face of the legislation. On that basis, I would ask the Member not to press his amendment. Jamie Green to wind up and indicate whether he presses or withdraws. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I um, uh, just clarify that, uh, perhaps, uh, and, and perhaps invite the Cabinet Secretary to, to intervene in my summing up, um, that he's confident that um, future guidance notes that accompany disclosure applications or, or, uh, uh, will make reference to this, the existence of this piece of legislation? Well, there will be specific guidance will be issued in relation to the application of this legislation uh, once it's been approved by Parliament. 
Uh, that is very often the case for uh, all pieces of legislation, uh, and that will be provided and tailored to assist and advise those relevant organisations. For example, the organisations that Alex Cole Hamilton made reference to, uh, that would happen as a matter of course uh, in these matters. Um, uh, but you wouldn't stipulate that on the face of the legislation. Uh, and the reason the guidance is issued is uh, pretty simple. It is to make sure that the application of the Act is properly implemented uh, and that it's properly understood by these agencies. So that will happen as a matter of course and happens with them um, all, if, I think, probably all pieces of legislation uh, that bring in new statutes of this nature. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that. I'm, I'm reassured by his comments in that respect. Okay, do you wish to press a withdrawal? Withdrawal. Withdrawal. Committee content? Yep. Yes. Thank you very much. I now call Amendment 5 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group of its own, and I'd wish to point out that if <coughs> Amendment 5 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 13, 14 and 15 because of a pre-emption. Cabinet Secretary, to move and speak to Amendment 5. Amendment 5 amends Section 14, which makes provision regarding the regulation-making powers contained in the Bill to provide that two of these powers will now be subject to affirmative procedure. First, the power under Section 10.3 to prescribe the manner in which references to disregarded convictions are to be removed. And second, the power under Section 10.5 to prescribe relevant record keepers to which the disregard scheme applies. This amendment responds to the recommendations at paragraph 115 of the Committee Stage 1 report that given the importance of such regulations to the effective operation of the disregard scheme, eh, they should be subject to affirmative rather than negative resolution procedure. We accepted these recommendations in our stage in our response to the Stage 1 report and I therefore move Amendment 5. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Does committee members wish to participate in the debate? No. Cabinet Secretary, wind up. No. No, no wind up. Uh, the question is, that Amendment 5 be agreed? Are we all agreed? agreed. Yes. We are all agreed, and the pre-emption rule stands. So uh, the next question is, that Section 14 be agreed? Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, the next question is, that Sections 15 to 18 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that the long title would be agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed? And that ends stage two of the consideration of the bill. Thank you so much. Well Cabinet Secretary, thank you very much. Uh, can I put on record, actually, that this has been a superb bill to work with, very well drafted, and with an intention that actually makes us all incredibly uh, proud to be part of this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so that concludes section uh, stage two, consideration of the historic sexual offences, pardons and disregard Scotland Bill. Can I thank all members for your participation this morning? It's been uh, great to see it. And the next meeting will be the 31st of May, starting at 9.30 in this committee room. We have no meeting next week. Jamie. Just before we close the meeting, uh, uh, Mary's run away. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Have a, have a seat, Mary. <laughs> uh, just before we close the meeting, I'd like to place on record, whilst the official report is still here, today's my last meeting of this uh, uh, committee. Uh, I'm very sad to move on to another committee, but I would like to place on record my thanks to my committee colleagues, to the convener, deputy convener, the clerk, staff, and everyone who works in this committee it does an excellent job. It's been a real priv privilege and a pleasure to be a part of this committee this past year, and I wish it uh, all, all the very best in its future uh, deliberations. So thank you for having we'll me. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Jamie, and I suppose on behalf of the committee, can we give our grateful thanks to the work you've done in sometimes very tenacious fashion, which is always welcome <laughs> on a committee, and wish you well in your new endeavours. Thank you. I now close the meeting. <laughs>